Last video, we talked about how we could strip down parts of films. We questioned the essential nature and the standards we've placed onto dialogue, logic, pacing. But like I said, we're gonna keep going deeper. We're taking out a big chunk this time. Scripts are often seen as synonymous with the movie. It's how a movie kinda starts being made. It's how they are pitched to production companies or festivals. At that phase, the script pretty much is the movie. And once it's made, it's easy to get why people look to the screenplay as one of the most crucial parts of what makes a movie. Of course, we know that cinema did not start out that way. What are often regarded as the first movies were just these moments of everyday life. They were sometimes called actualities. The practice of cinematography was there to document. Whether it be a train arriving at the station or workers leaving the factory. Early cinematographic equipment were used to study the movement of capybaras. And some other less important things too. They were not for creating these scripted narratives or sequencing a bunch of planned moments together. But as the commercial filmmaking industry grew, profit has motivated filmmakers away from that mode of creation and instead towards making stuff like actors, dialogue, and fictional plots were more commonplace. So I want to focus on films that were likely executed without script writing, not because script writing wasn't a thing yet, but because Despite already being commonplace, these artists just decided they didn't want to. So I already mentioned the documentary function of cinema. And even if documentaries as we know them aren't fiction, they're still heavily planned and staged with some sort of a script to a degree. This critique of documentary film led to the Cinema Verite movement which attempted to record reality more directly and use an honest acknowledgement of the camera to confront subjects with real behaviors. A similar movement that developed is direct cinema, which captures reality with as little manipulation as possible. Meaning improvisation and observation serve as key aspects of the fly-on-the-wall production style. Cinema Verite was inspired by Giga Vertov's Kino Pravda theories. He also popularized one of the coolest subgenres of documentary, the city symphony. Man with a movie camera simply enjoys the modern city it exists in. It plays around with a myriad of formal techniques in editing to share its beauty without a line of dialogue or human protagonist. It is structured less like a play or a novel and more like, well, a symphony. And since there is this strong relation to music, maybe that's why Kayan Eskatsi is the biggest name for this type of thing. Philip Glass goes hard over these grand scale sceneries of whole environments and societies just doing what they do. Another popular example of this outside the Katsi trilogy would be Baraka and Samsara. Now these ones have great sequences. Even if they do seem to flow freely, there's likely a shooting script made for elaborate stuff like this. I'm not so sure there was ever a script made for logistics. A documentary about delivery systems that has a running time of 35 days and 17 hours. The value of that kind of conceptual art piece would likely differ from the films we are accustomed to. The significance may not only be found in the experience of viewing, but also just thinking about how this movie exists at all. Because it would be really hard to watch that whole thing, and it likely would have been even harder to write a script for it. Now, of course, there's definitely a reason why people make scripts for movies. Good sequencing feels satisfying, plot twists are exhilarating, dialogue can be relatable. Throwing all of that out could be alienating. But a question I want you to constantly ask yourself throughout all the weird stuff to come in this whole series is, how can I possibly appreciate this? For these next films, I think that if you can appreciate A View of the Mountains, then you certainly can appreciate some landscape films. 
if these were to have a script, it would just say, there are beautiful mountains, or here is a sky, or maybe even 10 skies, like in James Benning's film, 10 Skies, a sister film to his 13 Lakes, which is also exactly what it says in the title. In this channel, I've encouraged you before to try watching a movie like how you would watch a sunset. Well, this is gonna be one of the more literal times to apply that mentality. Watching a sky for 10 minutes each, 10 times, should be easier than you think. This is something that everyone has done and likely had fun doing. Finding shapes in clouds is an activity that is very personal in nature. You project what you want to see onto the scene. This is how you make the film through watching it. We'll keep coming back to that notion, as films that create these absences also inspire us viewers to fill in the blanks. One of the strengths of Ten Skies is that it's an attempt to create art that is not so artificial. A spectacle that's increasingly hard to capture with how much humanity has marked what they've considered is their territory. It's easy to overlook this natural wonder. It's the world's screensaver, flowing in constant motion, which lends itself well to the medium of film. Peter Hutton also does great work of this kind. Now, in my opinion, these are simply great pieces of film. But be honest, if this was the first three minutes of a movie and your friend just got in the theater late, would you be one to tell them, oh, don't worry, nothing's happened yet? When there's a lack of human characters or clear-cut plot point, why do we feel like we have to erase the subject of the film, which is already there? We don't hold the same standard to other notable art forms. Landscapes are enough to make a widely beloved work of painting or photography. Both mediums have their own attributes to offer to a landscape, but film certainly has its own significant and distinct possibilities. This could be as simple as the power to watch the fading away of a line of fog, like in Fogline by Larry Gottheim. My favorite cinematic rendering of a landscape would be in La Region Central. Here, director Michael Snow had the idea to compose a film without human interaction. There are no actors here, at all. And even the cameraman is not even a man. It's a special camera rig invented to record the humanless Canadian mountains in every direction. They ended up with 60 hours of footage and just cut it down to three hours. A script for this movie likely does not exist, but that doesn't stop it from being a satisfying adventure. I don't think any of these shots were really planned beyond the initial concept of shooting in every direction, which probably couldn't even be storyboarded either. Michael Snow just wanted to go out there and play with some cool equipment and discover what kind of visual experience that could create. You don't even have to apply this thinking on a landscape. Snow did some structural experiments with camera movements inside of some rooms, like in back and forth and in wavelength. These are very simple films whose story can be recounted in just a short phrase, but you can get a lot from watching them. If these silent spectacles don't sound appealing to you, then maybe you'd prefer a movie that is only its script and nothing else. Well, Snow also made that. So is this, is composed entirely of words. It makes the power of the audience to convey meaning pretty blatant with one by one shots of words that were supposed to relate to the last one and the next one. Paul Sharitz also did something like this with Word Movie. Would you even call these movies or would you rather call them poems? I believe this one is a film, instead, about how our minds tend to reach for meaning, seek patterns out of random sensations. It's hard to think of letters and words as mere illustrations that don't immediately hold widely accepted meaning. But you certainly can do that. 
I'm sure a thought that has passed through your head by now is, why would anyone make these? This is so weird and maybe even trivial. Well, an oversimplifying answer to that would be that they make these movies because they can. What I'm getting at here is that approaching filmmaking through unconventional production processes frees you from the constraints of more conventional filmmaking. Often due to a lack of resources, artists have to squeeze out some extra ingenuity to figure out how their movies can be made. But sometimes, a good artist can see a different angle of something that's right in front of us. Films can be DIY. Due to the fact that a lot of these films are obviously not commercially viable, they have to be made with no investments or expectations of turning a profit. This applies to almost all movies I'll be talking about in this series. But in the next video, we'll be talking specifically about films that have no budgets. See you all there.